Hi, and welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast, where we talk about images and the people who make them. I'm Roger Sakala, the founder of LensRentals.com. Welcome to the Linternals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. I'm here today with Roger Sakala. Good day. And Eric Morrison. Hello. Uh, and today we're going to do something a little different. We're kind of doing a little in-house company history because we just fulfilled our millionth order, which is crazy. Who'd have thought that would happen? It's nuts. Yeah. Um, it happened probably, we're a little bit in the future from it. Probably two weeks ago mm -hmm. was when when like order number one million officially went out, and so we're gonna kind of talk through the beginning of the company and a little bit of inside baseball historical stuff. But <laughs> before I get to that, this is the first time we're hearing Eric on the podcast. Um, Eric is our tech room manager. Can you give me just like a brief description of what your job is? We know each other. I don't want to sound like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I basically help coordinate uh, the kind of personnel that test the equipment that goes out on rentals. So, you know, a lot of our business is just fulfilling orders. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, they come back to us and we have to reinspect them to make sure they're up to a certain quality standard uh, so that we feel comfortable sending out to the next order. And so I coordinate that, work with a group of people who uh, develop how we're supposed to test things and um, yeah, just make sure everything's running in order. And just you're not talking about three or four people. This is a pretty big section here. Yeah, we're now up to about 30 individuals who help us test uh, everything from the power cable that goes into the AC adapter to the phantom brain so that uh, everything works the way you need it to. Right. Yeah. So Eric supervises kind of the heart of this operation. Fulfillment's very important, obviously. It, it, it's all all very important, but the, the people testing everything day to day are kind of supervised by Eric. And the reason you're hearing him now for the first time is that he is a lot busier than anybody else. <laughs> really? Well, yeah, we have not had time to bring him in yet. Um, I think I also, you know, since I've been here for a fairly long time. Yeah. And I, and, I, and I feel I came in on one of like the huge shifts, like the big turn for Lens Rentals. You know, obviously the first one was getting out of Roger's garage yeah as we all know you but. mean hiring me right so <laughs> you hired me and, that was the next and everything that changed the yeah and then uh you know uh i think it was you know the introduction of the idea of video to lens rentals and i think that has really uh you know and th there's a story behind that but that is really kind of over the last 10 years that i've been here kind of driven our growth uh, and so people are clear Eric and Chris kind of drug me kicking and screaming into video because uh, I'm the guy who went, this will never catch on. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I remember uh, I was lucky enough to get a job at Lens Rentals because Aaron was my brother's college roommate and I was the only video guy anyone knew. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> Weird insular thing. And, and so incestuous. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nepotism runs deep at Lens deep Rentals. Deep and rampant at Lens Rentals. <laughs> How many of your family members? <laughs> uh, well, we got two of my family members. At the time you came, I think we had four different married couples out of like 15 employees. Yeah. Well, I want to start at the beginning. Before we get into any like labor law violations, <laughs> we should cover how the company sort of started. Roger, what were you doing for a living when you like, I, had the idea? I was practicing medicine and photography was my hobby. Okay. And you were shooting – what did you shoot before? Well, I, at, the, at this time, I was shooting mostly Canon, um, and the reason for Canon was digital came. Um, my background in photography was I actually started in the lab in uh, early Photoshop and NIH image and in a college biology department. Um, and they had Canon equipment, and the Digital Rebel came out, and it was like, oh, well, that's a good idea. I'll try that. So that got me into the Canon side of things, and I was there for several years. Just like hobbyist photographer. Right. Hobbyist photographer. I'd do portraits for friends. I mean, I was pretty busy. And at the time, I had a small website selling Memphis scenery pics. And actually, it did okay. Um, but that was it. You know, what was not pro at all. Um, but I probably photographed five days a week. 
And it, it, it started with you just running out one lens at a time. Is that about right? Just like from your sort of personal. Well, it started inventory? really. I was I was going to Alaska on a cruise and I wanted a big telephoto lens. And I thought, oh, I've never used one before. I'll probably never use it again. I'll rent it. And found out at that time, this is 2006, I couldn't. If you didn't live in a big city and rental at that time for an individual was, you basically bought the lens on your credit card. And when you Mm -hmm. brought it back, they refunded everything but the rental fee. So I ended up buying it. And then I'm like, well, I must not be the only person who ever wanted a rental lens they don't have. Yeah. And uh, I invested $50 in an off-the-shelf website. (laughs) And... uh, Took all my gear and put it on the website because I figured most of it wasn't rentable, but I didn't want to like put four things up there. Mm-hmm. And uh, literally, as I recall, I think all of my stuff was rented out that week. Do you remember who the first order was? Any idea? I don't at this time, but it was somebody local. Yeah. Uh, because I was in a local camera club and said, well, I'm going to rent this gear. And I think it may have been that lens I bought for Alaska. Was it like mostly local at the beginning? No. Um there were some local people who thought it was a great idea. The vast majority thought I was out of my mind and it was a stupid idea. Um, and uh, I was in online forums and different things and people knew I was doing it and put this little website up and, and literally, you know, part of it was filling a vacuum. If you Googled Lens Rentals, I had the name Lens Rentals and there was no other site. So they found me. <laughs> <laughs> that is nuts. That like I think – you know, a lot of this, obviously, there were business decisions involved and a small amount of luck and a lot of effort and a lot of very talented employees. But also just SEO at the beginning. It's blind luck that lens rentals in Google didn't turn up any results. Yeah, but, it was it. And, you know, I think that was part of the motivation as I, I Googled it and there was nothing. And I thought, well, the name's available I'm not sure. I think I I purchased the name before the vacation. So before Lens Rentals was, I was like, somebody ought to own that name. Probably at the time thought I'll sell it to the smart guy who wants to make a rental company later on, you know. When did you decide that that was you? Like what what was the turning point to say this is actually viable? I should risk it or risk something on this? Um, I think there were several. It, it, you think of it as, a oh, I made this decision and went forward. I almost closed shop about four times. Um, so it was never an ongoing thing. Um, I put it up and all the stuff rented. And at the time I thought, I can buy more stuff and I'll get depreciated on my taxes because it's a business. And that was plenty for me. That's all I really had as a goal, you know. <laughs> uh, Did people see it as your hobby, like everyone you worked with? And at that time, oh, Roger's funny little hobby that he's got. No, they thought of it as my insanity. The number of people who told me you're out of your mind uh, was basically everybody. And, um, you know, it's um, the number of folks who I approached later on and went, do you want to come in on this? And they just would go, are you crazy? Hell no. I don't want anything to do with it. The last camera shop that closed in Memphis, I approached him and said I'd give him half the business if he'd let me have the spare room to just do it out of. He said, I want nothing to do with it. I like you, Roger. I don't want to see you lose all your money. Oof. Truth. What year was that? 2007. Oh, wow. Yeah. When, when did Will come in? Uh, Will emailed me. Uh, for those who don't know, Will is our now the head of a very large IT department. He emailed me and he said, you have the best idea and the crappiest website I've ever seen. And I said, <laughs> well, yeah, I put 50 bucks into it and I'm not investing any more money. And as I recall, Will basically emailed me back and said, I'm a programmer. I, I think he did the uh, database for Hospital Corporation of America Pharmacy. And he said, I'll make you a website and some back end stuff. That attracted me because at the time I was keeping inventory on an Excel spreadsheet and we had like maybe 80 things. So if it got rented, I moved a little X from the inbox to the outbox. <laughs> yeah. nice. This was not an efficient thing. So mm-hmm. I said, well, I can't really, I'm not put money in this. I mean, it's, you know, it's more of a hobby business. And he said, well, how about you just give me, you know, like maybe 2% of the gross every month. And I said, oh, well, okay. Cause I thought I'm ripping him off bad. Cause that would be like 18 bucks. And he did all this work. The funny part of the story is I never met Will for four years. <laughs> I've, still, I've never met Will. Yeah, Will comes down once a month now, but he was in Chicago. I was here. And, um, you know, the company's growing, and we were doubling in business every couple of months. And Will's mm-hmm. churning this stuff out in his spare time. And then it got to the point where Will was spending a lot of time on it. And 
that that percentage he was getting every month was was pretty impressive. The, the whole point of the story is it was really me and Will. Um, and I was here and I was boxing boxes in the garage, but Will was doing all the background stuff that made us look a lot more professional than we probably were. Yeah, storefront. It's curb appeal, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And throughout all of this, you're still in your house, right? You're just oh, kind of yeah. running this out of a corner of your house. <clears throat> I had a spare bedroom with a big walk-in closet and um, uh, le- red letter days. We sp- we packed in the garage, um, which had no air conditioning in Memphis in the summer. It wasn't pleasant. Mm. Red letter days were things like I filled up the walk-in closet with lenses. I was like, that was a big deal. Uh, I bought a two-wheeler so we didn't have to slip all the boxes to the curb to the UPS driver, you know, by hand. Nice. Uh, it was pretty small. And then we moved into 1,500 square feet, I guess, in 2008. And uh, luckily, everybody else in the building kept going under, so we kept taking their space. Mm-hmm. How many days or how many hours a day were you operating? Well, in the early days, my schedule was I got up at 4 and did emails till 7. I went to work. And then I spent my lunch hour doing emails. I left early, like about 3, 3.30, and went home and filled orders. And at that time, I would be cleaning, packing, inspecting. Um, Worked Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, my my usual day was probably 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. really. But through all of this, like from just you and your closet to now we're at like 10 people in a small office, at no point was it not profitable, right? It depends on how you define profitable. Okay. It was growing really fast and we were buying lots of stuff. So this was a, a time when no matter how much we brought in, we were virtually always had a list of things we needed to buy. Mm-hmm. So every dime went back in and lots of other dimes went back in too. So was it profitable? It kind of depends how you talk about it. We were growing so fast that I was borrowing more money than we were bringing in every month. We also didn't have you know one-on-ones with – manufacturers and things like we have now. No, nobody knew. I mean, nobody was, there was one other place doing it and then a couple were starting about this time, but this whole online rental thing was pretty crazy. Um, the other fun story was everybody, to show you how, how nuts this was, um, my parents called their CPA to talk to me about not doing this. <laughs> Who gave me the lecture about, I've seen He's this great old guy, but he was he was about 75 at the time, and he was like, I've seen many doctors invest in businesses. It never works. Never does it work. But the same thing happened. We were getting busy at this time, and I went to my group, which is a big medical practice with probably 60 doctors, and said, I'm going to need to go part-time. I started this business. And the, the medical director of the group patted me on the head and said, I've seen this so many times. I want you to go talk to the business managers about this. They'll, they'll show you what you're doing. So I went and talked to him, and after 15 minutes, they looked at me and said, oh, you need to go part-time. And I went, yeah, I know. <laughs> and then the uh, other one said, you probably need to leave here in about six months. And I said, that's what I thought, too. So that's how I exited. So but do you remember – so we're still at the point where we're just entirely photography equipment. Do you remember your first – camera bodies was it, it mostly lenses at first or it, it was it was some bodies mostly lenses we probably had i mean we started with probably 50 or 60 lenses and maybe three bodies mm-hmm. and it was the first generation canon like uh 5d and i not even sure if it was a 70 at that time but around that era and we were all canon because that's what i had to start with i already you know put all my gear into it and uh, added nikon a little later, and uh, stayed kind of in that two realm thing. Somebody started a place that was Pentax only, or something to that effect, and Sony was just starting out, and so there was a Sony place. So I kind of left them alone. Um, well, at that time, Sony had no, no great the, digital offering. The yeah. NEX crop frame cameras yeah. were, were all the Sony offerings, and the Alphas, of course, they bought mm-hmm. Minolta. So there wasn't a lot of that business, and I didn't think there was room for us in there. So we were Canon and Nikon for quite a while. And then um, the 5D2 era Canons really pulled us into video because everybody started shooting video on them, and suddenly we needed video accessories. And if you're going to get into video accessories, then maybe you should get into video cameras. And that's kind of where Eric came, and I got out of the way because I knew nothing about that whole aspect of it. And getting back into your first employees, I know Scott – so Scott, your first sort of technician. Yeah. Um, still works here. 
he at the time – he was a student, right? Photography student? He was a photography student and he he wasn't – I don't know if he's going to class much because he was working nearly full time. Yeah. But he would come in and sit at the computer and you know kind of help me with the emails during the day and fill the orders and get everything prepped. Um, did – he and Steve both did some inspection and testing and cleaning kind of stuff, but mm-hmm. you know I, I still double checked a lot of it, and that was kind of the flow of it all. And uh, when we got into leaving the house, we had that's kind of when full time people were common. Uh, yeah, but every, still relatively young, relatively recently out of college. Yes, almost everybody was a recent uh, photography school or art school graduate. Yeah, almost exclusively people who. Either shot video, sh- shot photos, yeah. things like that. You know, part-time photographers still doing stuff on the weekend. Absolutely. And that was one of the things they could take gear. We started that back in those days because everybody was working. Um, Which I will proudly say that we still do that now at 150 employees or whatever. Oh, offer yeah. free rentals to uh, all of our employees. Yeah. I, I That's why I took this job. And I think probably <laughs> why a lot of people took this job. Ryan thought he was going to make it. Yeah. He was going to use Lens Reynolds gear to do it. I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong about that. But it's such a win-win because, you know, you both are out of the tech room, wrote stuff. But when you were, people call all day and say, what's this gear like? And if you took it home for the weekend, you can really answer the question. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's a huge thing for both sides. Everybody wins when you take stuff home. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't see us ever stopping. No. It's like a it's a really, really important thing for – you know, you can teach people as much as you can in an office environment, but it really takes kind of getting out there and using this stuff on your own to be able to talk to people about and, it. And these days, I think it's much more important because it's the time of, OK, how do I put this brand's monitor with this brand's recorder and this camera and these lenses? And you go out there on the weekend and explore the edge of the envelopes and you can give somebody some really good advice mm-hmm. um, that they probably want to don't want to try in front of their director of photography for the first time. You know, well, I, I know. You know, specific examples where people packing the box with the gear will notice some kind of incompatibility because they took it home that weekend and right. couldn't get it to work or have some question about it. And they'll be able to be that, like, last line of defense. And it's just having that knowledge. And, and we, you know, you don't have time, you know, during the work day to kind of figure that those nuances out. And I think the other positive is – it, it's like you guys both just said. It gets people here who we would otherwise not get. Yes, 100%. And yeah, it attracts a specific type of employee who is somebody who not just knows what they're doing but like has a passion for this stuff and even after working here five days a week wants to go out and shoot video or photo themselves on the weekends. I think that's a huge – I think that's a huge differentiator for us because in any business, not just the rental business or the, or the or the camera business, to have a business our size, which is now in a couple of buildings and a couple of cities and mm-hmm. I think 200 people, the vast majority are into this stuff. They're not here punching the clock. Um, we get a new piece of equipment and people are excited and I'll walk through the other building and people stop me going, did you see we got this? Did you see we got that? And they're pumped about it. I think that shows. I think the customers see that we are into the equipment. Well, yeah, I think that's a good spot for a break. We'll take a quick break, and then uh, when we come back, I want to talk about how we got into video when Eric started and uh, where we're at now. Now, Lens Rentals brings you a meditation moment. Close your eyes. Lean back and listen to my voice. You feel yourself getting sleepy. Relax. Drifting on a cloud. You love this podcast. You want to give this podcast a five-star rating. You want to write a positive review of it and even subscribe to it. You know that will bring you a feeling of joy and contentment. When I count to three, you will wake up refreshed and go straight to the review page. One, two, three. Welcome back to the Lens Journals podcast. We're talking kind of the history of the company to celebrate our millionth order. Um, Roger, I want to sort of fast forward a little bit 
Uh, so when when we took a break away, we were you had sort of just moved into like an official building. We're sort of just right. doing this full time. Had probably fewer than a dozen employees. Um, I want to fast forward a few years to um, when you decided to bring Eric here on. What was the thought process for getting into video? Was it even a plan before you hired a video-specific person? It, it was not a plan. Uh, we were getting drug into video because the Canon 5D2 was lending itself to video and not just people who were photographers trying to do video, but video people reaching out for that camera. And so suddenly we're interacting with video folks. The one thing I remember was somebody shot a film and they wanted a bunch of 5D2s and they put them on shoulder mounts and had their cameraman in the scene. It was a military thing shooting their 5D2s on shoulder mounts for close up because it looked kind of like guys with rifles. Or I think something. it was Active Valor. It was Shane Hurl, but who, okay. who rented from us for a while. Um, he, you know, yeah. He's the guy famously who got yelled at by Christian Bale. Yes, <laughs> right. Famously. So, and, and that was a big thing. And, I, and I'm realizing at this point, OK, we have to go here. I know nothing about it. And this company became kind of Eric's story at that point because we're that's when we got that who knows somebody that knows about video because none of us did yeah and uh I definitely didn't know as much as uh I needed to at that point but it was definitely a good learning spot because um all our business was video wise was renting uh the 5d2 with with lenses and and support gear so we were learning as the industry was actually developing because you know, yeah, where the industry we all, was learning then too. That yeah, was, I mean that's what Red Rock and Zacuto and all these companies start springing up because there's this now void. It's this um, consumer priced camera that allows you to have imagery that ma- matches or rivals what you can do with film cameras. Mm-hmm. The learning curve has completely gone away, the, and it's small, and it's small, and and the and the and I, I imagine at the time the bigger camera manufacturers, the bigger rental houses were just kind of laughing at this fad or whatever. They weren't interested in getting into it. So all these companies sprang up and we were there like right at the the start of it. And, it, and for a long time, we were the only place you could go to get a 5D2 rental. And I remember that time because it was so out of proportion to our other business. The number of 5D2s we had was just like – we had more of those than we had lenses at one point. I think it was it was massive. And I think you we had a, a kind of partnership or a, a retail deal with Zeiss, and and we started to build that up because everyone who had turned to that was looking for higher quality glass. They right. were willing to trust Canon's glass at that time. They weren't Sigma was kind of a joke. At well, they the wanted ma- mechanically focused. Yeah, lenses and they wanted yeah the ability to have full control over their. And Zeiss was just not big in the U.S. That's not like they are today. They were fairly small, and um, you couldn't walk into your local camera store and look at a Zeiss lens in those days mostly. Or they were developing stuff with, you know, for Ari or for, you know, other companies. Sony had Zeiss contract and stuff yeah. like that. So that, that all worked out, and, and we became more and more video, and I became less and less. <laughs> I became at this point a lens specialist because I no longer had the knowledge base to keep up with the cameras and stuff. I can remember there was a lot of resistance also to the idea that Lens Rentals was becoming a video, such a video-centric co- company. And it's certainly where we are now with, with the kind of offerings we have. A lot of our growth is driven by what new areas of video we're moving into. But when uh, Roger's son Drew started at Lens Rentals, I remember Chris and I were uh, maybe asking for – a, a larger table that we could work on or something right. like that. And he was like, you guys are only a small portion of the company. You're only ever going to be a small portion of the company. You're never going <laughs> to. Right. And these kind of laughed us out. Yeah, I like being able to do this when Drew's not here to defend himself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he'll, he'll readily own up to that one. Yeah. And, and for people who don't know, Drew came back after finishing law school and Drew's camera knowledge at that point was he had none. Uh, he he knew business and and business law, and would come in and look at what we had been doing, and just kind of extrapolate like most business people. That's what we'll be doing going forward, and it was uh, it was not so at all. I I know it's it's tough to estimate this because, and I'm sure this is the problem Drew was having. It's hard to tell who's shooting what when everybody's using the same 5D2 camera body. Do you have even a broad idea of what percentage of video customers we're talking about here? 
As far as number of customers in those days, they were becoming, I would guess, 20 percent or so. But my thinking at that time, you have to remember this 5D2 thing was brand new, and my thought was, and is this a fad? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I wasn't sure, just like when 3D came, and it was kind of the same thing in a small microcosm. Everybody's like, we got to get 3D, we got to get 3D. And I'm like, you know, I'm not sure this is going to stick. It may be a fad. We had the same thing with the 5D2 video. Is that going to stick? And I think the one theme that kept coming back to me over and over in the years Lens Rolls have been going is I kept expecting the big guys to come in and smite us. Mm-hmm. So the 5D2 is doing video. It's only a matter of time till the video companies catch on to this, and they jump in the game, which never happened. Um, I had the same thing with lens rentals. It's only a matter of time till those big rental companies see what we're doing, and they're going to come smite us, and they never did. I think it was last year that I, I got over the, the Amazon hammer coming down on us right. and taking, taking we, we, over. It, we were fear-based at that time. We're yeah. a little company. I'm in debt up to my eyeballs, and if this is a fad, I don't want to get too deep into it. Yeah. But it was no fad. It's funny that we're sort of um, – we're driven a lot by – uh, customer decisions that way, mm-hmm. like the what customers are renting from us sort of drives where we go, and that might seem obvious. I guess that seems obvious in retrospect, but it is a little uh, surprising in the moment. I remember when I started, um, you know, we were past only carrying like DSLRs and stuff, right? But uh, we were into like a lot of camcorders, and I, I think a big change. Early on when I was here was a Movi, the Freefly Movi um, M5. I remember that being like brand new my second week. And And it became huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's an entirely new segment. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just a popular product. It's something um, that we never carried before and drives rentals of like specialized monitors for gimbal work and uh, counterweights and wireless follow focuses. It's just like there are these sort of keystone products that change the direction of where we go. You know, there, there was a thing you probably, neither of you, I don't know if you're aware of, that happened right before then, behind the scenes. It was huge. And at that time, I was the purchasing manager. I was the everything manager, you know. And Tyler and Drew came into my office one afternoon and said, uh, you know, close the door. And I'm like, oh, crap, what's happening? And uh, so we, we need you to stop purchasing. <laughs> and I'm like, you don't understand. Of all the people here, I have the most knowledge. I know these things backwards and forwards, blah, blah, blah. I went on a little five-minute speech, and they looked at me and said, that's correct, and that's why we need you to stop. Because you're buying this cool stuff that doesn't rent, and we need more 2470 F2.8s. And Tyler had worked up some kind of little computer widget with Will behind my back that would actually trend what we needed instead of what I wanted. And that's when we kind of became customer-driven. And now there's, you know, there's subsets. We've got a little internal thing for when customers make requests that it tags them and flags them. So from that point on, when I got out of the way, all this stuff probably couldn't have happened if it wasn't for that day. Yeah, I think I think it was when we also decided that we were just going to never not have something that someone wanted. Yeah. You know, like at that point, then it just opened it up to just explode. And and, and we really did see an explosion uh, somewhere around my third year. And, and I guess that would have been 2013, mm-hmm. 2014 of just business uh, and and items that we were carrying. And, and it hasn't slowed down. It's only gotten, you know. Yeah, I just watched that channel now and see us going – Working through the process of who who wants it's like twenty this. things a day now. Oh yeah, yeah, it's nuts, and it's it's crazy, and and there's no human being that is deciding what we needed. Kind of the mass vote decides what we will stock, and it's a much better way to do it. Mm-hmm. It was uh, sounds so logical, but at the time, I was so offended. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I am curious about that. So, like at a certain point, you know, you're getting bigger. There's more money coming in. Um, and you, you you sort of get forced into making these um, decisions where like, okay, I need somebody with like an MBA in here. To, right. Yeah. So what, what was the process like transitioning from more of a I'm the only person in charge here to sort of having more input and eventually 
letting go most of that control. Knowing this was your baby and you were the only one who ever believed in it. Right. <laughs> yeah. The the one word description is ugly. I can expound on that if you'd like. I would like that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there were events that happened. Um, so in a, in a quick timeline, early in our as we were leaving the house, going to the office place, there was a month that all the money was spent. I could borrow no more, and I ran up an eighty thousand dollar American Express bill. And we either made eighty thousand dollars that month, or I was in some serious trouble. And we made it, and we never were financially stressed again after that. Kristen came on, then Tyler Drew, all these people have business knowledge, which I didn't have. And over the next, I'd say, 18 months, with various claw and scratch marks, I slowly started letting go of things when, you know, it went from I'm the one who knows and nobody else does to, oh, these people know more than me about this area. Video was one. Finance was one. Uh, There was a day, I think it was Tyler that came in said, I need you to do this and this and this. And I'm like, okay. And he said, I need it done by 5 p.m. And I'm like, okay, but we're going to talk. And I, it was buying stuff and moving stuff. And I came back in and said, what was that about? And he talked business, which I really didn't follow. But after I got into Translate, there was depreciation stuff going on and things needed to be changed over for tax purposes. And in that one afternoon, he saved us more money than everything I'd done for the last two months. And I realized, okay, I need to get out of the business stuff. Um, That was part of it. There was another day that my thing for a while, and you were here, Eric, I know. I don't know if Ryan still was. But on really busy days, I'd leave my office to go help out. (laughs) (laughs) And that was another lecture I got with you need to stop helping. And Literally, they showed me the figures that if I came and helped pack, everybody else's packing dropped twenty percent. It's like plus minus a basket. Yeah, like, you, know, okay. <laughs> you pack sixteen boxes, and everybody else packed twenty less because you were there, and they were freaking out. So, it was a learning experience. Um, mm-hmm. And at that same time, I was getting really interested in optics, and so I was developing our testing protocols. And there was the realization: this is a big place now, and I can't do everything anymore. And a lot of it, I'm really not very good at. And it took time. It took I'd say eighteen months. It was not the best time of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but in hindsight, you see that you left it in the hands of very capable and, and oh, in every case, it was people more capable than me. I mean, you and I look today, and the thought of me saying something about video is ludicrous because yeah. I know nothing. Um, and I didn't at that time either, but I wasn't letting that stop me. <laughs> mm-hmm. I want to talk about where we're at right now and what you all see for the future. Um, other than my retirement, yeah. <laughs> other than that, okay. So it's that um, when you were talking earlier about the percentage of video customers, that stuck with me because it hasn't uh, changed much. It was what about twenty percent when you all were carrying the five D two? Yeah, although it was twenty percent to which we were an afterthought. Yeah, you know, and I and I think you know, I guess going back to Chris and my argument to Drew. Um, we were saying that you're just valuing that on video gear going out. You're not taking into account that, mm-hmm. like, if someone is renting the 5D2 to shoot video, that's driving the rental of also the lenses and stuff like that. And we kind of had, you know, we were like, obviously, if someone's got, you know, more than three memory cards on their order, they're sure, certainly shooting video because why would they have the demand to do right. that? With, so, you know, we were trying to make our case however we could. But yeah, I think I would imagine that the. Again, I don't have a hard figure, but I think we're probably closer to 75 percent video now. I mean, and I think that that's that's the whole thing is that you could tell that we saw the video orders, like Eric said, with how many memory cards they had. Now you mm-hmm. can tell the video orders because it's how many things they got. Yeah, and and that, and that certainly makes sense because the you know we do a lot of single lens orders, supplemental orders, I guess is what I consider it as. Mm-hmm. But we're also sending entire shoots out to people. We're sending, you know, four light stands, four sandbags. And I think I went over this on another promotional thing. But it's like people are paying to have 100 pounds of sand sent, you know, through right. the through mm-hmm. the air. Or through, you know. But what are their options? Carrying it on the plane with them? Well, and that's – I mean, They don't have it. it it's something that I was, you know, myself and maybe a lot of other people were kind of resistant to the idea of we're going to send sand to people. But it really – my, my thought on that has changed because you look at it now and these big orders are coming back and all of them have sandbags on them. And you wonder how much of that other stuff they would have sourced locally if they had to source the sandbags. 
And I, I think if there's a defining challenge right now, it's what you mentioned, which is we are no longer just a place where you are getting a couple lenses to put on your own camera. We are, for a lot of people, the place where they're getting all of their equipment. And so that's that's been a big struggle in increasing scale. And I want to talk about what we've done to sort of uh, – deal with that specifically in the tech room eric i want to talk about the vip department yeah um i guess it's kind of our unkept secret (laughs) that we have vip you know yeah and i might have to cut all of this i have no idea if we like well i don't know yeah no i i think it's probably safe it's 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 actually we could refer to it as a section that handles complex orders yeah no yeah um, yeah, so what we do to address the kind of complexities, uh, I guess the best way to put it is uh, lensrentals.com offers all of these different options on their website. You can put them in a cart and you can press checkout mm-hmm. and you can give us your money and we'll send it to you. There's no – any other kind of certification. You don't have to give me – you know, like I remember when we were talking about steady cams and stuff like that and you have to have a licensed steady cam operator to to do this. Mm-hmm. You don't have to show us that you know what you're doing. You just have to, you know, place the order. Right. And that suddenly means that like anything I can fit into that cart is compatible. And, you know, it's so, as simple as just the wrong lens. So I rent an alpha lens with an email. You know, we get that happen a lot. It's Sony – you know, mm-hmm. but as we get into these bigger complex orders, it really becomes a matter of compatibility between all of the working parts. You know, does this camera with this lens balance on this gimbal when I want to use this follow focus and wireless monitoring solution? Are all of these pieces going to fit together? And, there, you know, we can look at orders and we can say, I think that this is what this person's trying to do. But we realized – you know, after a lot of failure in these big orders, you know, failure to make sure that the person had the proper media or make sure that they had, you know, as much batteries as they needed or even just make sure that these things work together. Right. Um, that we needed to invest a little time in contacting customers and finding out if what it is 